Y'all know who this is, right? We were madly in love. The Untold Story of MLK's White Girlfriend by Patrick Parr. It took me a long time to find Betty Moitz. Juice Crew. It took me a long time to find Betty Moitz. I had first learned her full name while reading Bearing the Cross, the 1986 biography about Martin Luther King Jr. written by David Garrow. In the book, Garrow briefly describes a serious relationship between King and a young white woman around the same age named Betty. They had met at Crozer Theology Seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania. At the time where King was a divinity student from the age of 19 to 22 when he graduated in May of 1951. And bearing the cross, Garrow quoted a close friend and mentor of King's at the time, Reverend Pius J. Barber, who said the relationship had left King as a man with a broken heart. He never recovered. In a way, I never recovered from that quote. As I wrote my own book about King, I wasn't satisfied with such a short description of such an apparently devastating relationship. Carol was the first biographer to, to discover Betty's last name, and fortunately for me, buried it in a heavyweight endnote at the back of the book. That endnote took me on two cross-country flights, spurred dozens of calls to wrong numbers, and knocks on countless doors of people I thought might have known Betty. They didn't. But I left my business card anyway, and eventually one of those people found someone who might know Betty. That person sent me an address to which I sent a letter. It worked. From the start, Betty Moitz and King's rape relationship was anything but carefree. Almost all of King's friends, including Barber, tried to discourage him from staying with Betty. Knowing what an interracial relationship would mean for his future. I thought it was a dangerous situation that could get out of hand. And if it did get out of hand, it would smear King. Okay, they're not talking about the clan going to see him with a white girl and beat him up or burn a cross in his yard. They're saying that. Martin Luther King being with a white girl would, would hurt him as being the next groomed civil rights leader for black people. It's interesting that in the 1950s, they're not worried about white people, what they think. They're worried about what other black people think. Press one. They're worried about what the niggas going to think about it. I thought it was a dangerous situation that could get out of hand, and if it did get out of hand, it would smear King. His Crozer classmate Cyril Pyle recalled in a 1986 interview, it would make his future hard for him. But Betty recalls that time, and the young King with fondness anyway. In our year-long correspondence, in one long meeting in January of 2016, Betty, who passed, who recently passed away at the age of 89, told me the story of their relationship and just how close King came to walking away from his future plans for her. She told him the story of their relationship and just how close Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
came to walking away from his future plans for her, a white woman. We were madly in love, madly in love. The way young people can fall in love. She told me during our conversation at her home, she started at the beginning. From a young age, Betty Moitz had a family connection to Crozer, where ML, as King was known at that time, was pursuing his studies before returning to his native Atlanta to follow his in his father's footsteps as the preacher at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Moitz's grandmother, Elizabeth, became the school's dietitian in 1933. When she retired, Betty's mother, Hannah Moitz, took over the position and she kept it until ML's, MLK's years there. The family lived in a five-bedroom, three-bedroom bathroom home in Crozer Cabinet Campus, and Betty graduated with honors from Eddie Stone High School, located only two miles away. Betty spent many days in her youth walking over to the kitchen to check on her mother, lending an extra hand. Okay, so it goes on about Betty and shit like that. I ain't gonna bore y'all with that. Then it says she was still a student at Moore in 1948 when she paid one of her regular visits to her mother in the basement of Old Main, the building of Crozier's campus. This day was different because Betty met someone new, a well-dressed, ambitious young man from Atlanta, Georgia, who was in his first year at the seminary and lived on the second floor of Old Main. He had a smooth voice and a sly smile. At first, she and MLK were just making small talk in Miss Hannah's kitchen. Nothing that would cause nearby students to turn their heads. But it continued. As they spoke on and off over the next few months, Betty learned about MLK's background and his tremendous hopes for the future. Crozer was known for its very radical religious institution, as a very radical religious institution. So I was surprised to hear from MLK himself that he had more conservative beliefs. He said ML was more conservative. MLK was more was conservative. MLK's own feelings for Betty were something he tried to keep secret. Though he'd, he'd even written to his mother about his other recent dating prospects, he would not have been at all eager to inform her that he was interested in a young white woman. Walter McCall, MLK's best friend and hallmate, who went by Mac, knew, of course, but he saw no harm in helping his best friend separate himself even further from racial norms they both believed were outdated. And though a few other students took note of MLK and Betty's friendly dialogue, it was, after all, a small world inside Old Main. No one seemed too bothered. Hmm. Fellow Crozier seminarian and King friend Marcus Wood in particular understood some of what spurred MLK's attraction. I suppose he thought that here I am out of the South now and not back home. Out in the open, nothing illegal, a free place. Sure, I can go over and talk to this white girl. Throughout the course of MLK's first year at Crozier, his relationship with Betty continued to develop as their chats moved out of Miss Hannah's basement kitchen. Soon MLK was also making the straight five-mile walk from Old Main to visit her at the Moit's home. He used to go over their house quite often to see her. MLK felt at ease with Betty. 
It was the enthusiasm with which he spoke on a wide range of topics that first attracted her. He would talk and talk and talk, Betty says. At first, they discussed his time in the South and how different it was from the idealized culture within the seminary. He didn't yet know how, but according to Betty, one thing MLK knew at the age of 19 was that he could change the world. Shout out to MLK, man. MLK fell in love with this white girl, man. Mm. Mm. Wow. Soon their dates mainly consisted of Betty driving MLK around the city of Chester, ignoring the scowls of society. I listened, Betty said, and he'd just talk and talk. But she loved it, his enthusiasm, his anxious hopes to return south and help people. He was wonderful, a joy to be with and listen to. When MLK's sister Christine came to visit him at Crozer, as she did regularly, his friendship with Betty crept back into the shadows. It wasn't that MLK didn't trust Christine. Their relationship had always been strong. It was the fact that Christine was a direct conduit to their mother. And that was something MLK could not risk. Telling his sister about Betty would have meant putting her in the an enviable position of withholding important information from her mother in every letter and phone call home. And if Christine were to slip that MLK had been getting closer to a white woman, MLK could only imagine the disappointment in his mother's eyes. Betty knew about these concerns. He was worried what she would think, she recalled. Over the course of the second year's relationship with Betty grew closer and more public. From chats in Miss Hannah's kitchen and around campus, the couple had progressed to hanging out with Mac, MLK's friend Horace Whitaker, and known as Wit, and others in the recreation room down the hall from the kitchen. Betty would watch as MLK and his friends play pool. The men who worked in the kitchen and dining room used to go down and shoot pool or play table tennis every evening. I was surprised how well MLK played. MLK would have known that dining at a predominantly white restaurant was a risky proposition, not only for himself, but Betty as well. But their relationship was a way for him to test limits of Northern culture. Such boundary pushing becomes easier when one starts to fall in love. And according to Betty, that's exactly what was happening. King was extremely fond of her, but he was also rather proud of the fact that he was able to socialize openly with the white girl. Mm. They were very serious, Wit remembered. Although he was young, Wit felt a certain sense of dread in telling MLK to deny his feelings towards Betty. I'm not saying he wasn't mature enough for that kind of experience, but I remember talking to him about that kind of marital situation. And we had talked about it from the standpoint that if he intended going back to the South and pastoring at a local church, that that might not be an acceptable kind of relationship in a black Baptist church. And I think he would be valuing that in light of whether or not it was a workable situation, knowing his own particular sense of call. So that, they already knew he was going to be the civil rights leader. He was already, they had already had him groomed to be the next civil rights leader. So it was like, man, you can't marry no white girl. What ended up happening was they they ended up hooking him up with um a woman, Coretta Scott King. And she was high yellow. 
Cause Martin ain't like no dark skin chick, man. Martin ain't one no dark butt, man. So they found him a high yellow broad, man. Um, Coretta Scott King, man. And the rest is history. But he never, according to his close friends, he never, ever, ever got over that white girl. And his heart was broken for the rest of his life. Because he couldn't have the woman that he wanted. He had to have, he had to have Coretta Scott. Well, I used to think Coretta Scott was fine when I was a kid. What's up, Alonzo, man? How you doing? What's going on? I'm doing pretty good. Didn't you think Coretta Scott King was fine when you was a kid? Well, nah, I only uh, grew up to know her as, you know, old, and so I never really seen her as such. How old are you? I'm 30. Oh, you a baby. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. You, a, you grew up at a different time, man. When I was growing up, that shit had, like, was still, like, recent and shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but uh, my great aunt went to high school with... Uh, MLK and I never heard this story ever. Like ever. Well, he never talks about it. He hid it. Yeah, I know. It, 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 it it's it's interesting. Like all the stuff that like you done like put out and now I found out it's like and then also that the fact that he hid everything, but it's just crazy. Even other details about you know him sleeping around with other women, like all of that stuff was never talked about when I was growing up. Well, here's my thing about the sleeping around. When you're married, when they when they force you to marry someone that you don't love, you love this one girl, the white girl, and you want to marry her. And you, but you're being groomed to be the next civil rights leader. They sent you to seminary school. You get your, you know, so you become an ordained priest. And then you're going to go back down to the South and go around the South and organize the movement. And they say you, under no circumstances can you do that with a white woman on your arm. It's just not going to fly. So now you have to let you the love of your life go. And they hooked you up with this other woman. This black chick, Coretta Scott King. And you not that into black chicks. Because as we know, all of the prostitutes that he really um that they bought were white. From the FBI footage. The FBI, I mean surveillance. That they 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 pretty much was like just getting white prostitutes. You know what I'm saying? Every night. Yeah. So I, I assume from that that he was into white girls and he wasn't too much into sisters. Um, So he, he's not into sisters and he's forced to marry one. And then he's on the road all the time. That's a terrible combination, man. You're not into sisters. You like white girls. They force you to marry a sister and you always, always, always on the road. <laughs> oh yeah i definitely get why he did it like, i mean there's no doubt about that you're a rock star you're going around the whole country it's just that i was just shot this to like get all of that information and it's like it was like it was hidden from me all of these years and you didn't know he was sleeping my around life no no you not know that part really later on like no um about probably two years ago maybe oh wow 22 years ago like Oct Channel really like everything that I was looking for. Oct Channel basically brought it. Like all these questions I had, Oct Channel brought it because I was sitting in my neighborhood and I'm like, man, I got this. I'm in a in a new neighborhood, but the new neighborhood just was so sunny. And Oct had put out a video. It was the very first video I watched, and it was like him explaining everything and it had visuals and it was talking about moving into a neighborhood and and being around sons like i was like yo this is this is what i've been i've been like wondering what the fuck is going on like why am i not happy and i and 
it just pieced everything together. It's like, yo, I found a solution to the problem. You from Atlanta? Yeah. The area. Oh man. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know what's crazy? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he never recovered. I mean, cause imagine you young, you meet a nice glider chick and like all she does is like listen to you and support you and try to understand you. And then you got to go marry your sister who's like cold and she ain't really <laughs> trying to hear all that. And she just, dang, now that's for the tough. Record, for the record, Coretta Scott was head over heels in love with him. Of course. He, just he was a rock star. Yeah, it just was. Well, no, I mean, she was the one. You got to understand who he is. He ain't, it ain't no, mis it ain't like organic that he became who he was. Yeah, he was groomed the whole time. He was going; they had groomed him to be that guy because he had such. His father was a big time preacher down there in Atlanta, and right. he had they had identified him. He he graduated high school at sixteen. He's very smart. He um, he was very very. Like he was it. He had that it factor. Yeah, the, like, the, the charisma the, and all that. Yeah. It was like this is the guy who's gonna lead the the um from a very young age. So they groomed him and then they sent him to seminary school and he fell in love with a white girl. That yeah. wasn't part of their plan. That was like a glitch in the matrix. Yeah, right. You see what I'm see, saying? Yeah, they ain't see that. Coming. I I I know exactly how he feels. Like when I was in middle school, I fell in love with a glider. Like she was thick, she had green eyes. And I came home to tell my mom, like, yo, I really like this girl. And I told her that she was a glider. And she, her reply was, if I can run my comb straight through her hair and it doesn't get stuck, then I won't accept it. Damn. <laughs> I mean, and if I believe that. I've comb, heard that. Don't bring her home. That's what my mother said. She said, if you yeah. can't use your comb, don't bring her home. But she didn't say it in the mean. She was kind of joking, but she said when I went to that Quaker school, she was like, if she can't use your comb, don't bring her home. A woman named Isola Ware Curry stabbed him with a letter opener at a Harlem book signing, nearly leaving him dead. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in 1968, but that was not the first attempt on his life. Dr. King was rushed to the hospital. After several hours of surgery, he survived, but barely. His surgeon declared that Dr. King would have certainly died if he had so much as sneezed with the letter opener protruding from his chest. Meanwhile, at the department store, where the book signing was taking place, police seized Isola Curry and arrested her. She told them that she had been after him for six years and that she was glad that she had stabbed him. Why did Isola Curry stab Dr. King? Isola Ware Curry moved to New York from Georgia at the age of 20 to begin work as a short order cook and a housekeeper. Shortly after her relocation, Curry developed paranoid delusions about the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Martin Luther King Jr., and other civil rights leaders. She was 42 years old when on September 20th, 1958, she- You know what, it just hit me, yo. If, the, if he would have died, right, say the sister would have killed him, both him and Malcolm X would have got killed in Harlem. Ain't that crazy? Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah, yeah, he's true. in Harlem. Damn. That's crazy. Harlem is a rough spot. Oh, Harlem, <laughs> man. Jeez. Jeez. Stabbed King while he was signing copies of his book, Stride Toward Freedom, at Bloomstein's department store in Harlem, New York. Curry approached King, asked if he was Dr. King, and when King responded yes, she pulled out a seven-inch steel letter opener from her purse and drove the blade into the upper left side of his chest. She also had in her possession a loaded 32 caliber semi-automatic pistol that was concealed in her bra. She could have easily reached for it, but had chosen the letter opener instead. King was rushed off. Sister had the gun and she wanted to get up close and personal. <laughs> yeah, that's, like, that's some personal shit. Stabbing him and then being happy that you stabbed him. <laughs> she was happy. And she opted to stab him over <laughs> the fucking 32. The semi automatic You gotta hate it's him, motherfucker. You that shit. Yeah, you really it's got different, it. man. Yeah. 
That's like I'm not even gonna take I'm not even gonna take the punk route and shoot you. I'ma put this blade through your fucking chest, you bitch ass nigga. <laughs> Look in your eyes while you die. I'm gonna, damn, hated wow. that man. They hate Jesus. It's them, this is different. Them, yeah, them, <laughs> them, them chocolate sisters I like though. That's the consequence of dealing with them drinks, man. Them joints stab you with a fucking letter opener. And think about a letter opener. Them drinks ain't even really that sharp. <laughs> yeah. So you got to drive it hard. Yeah. You really yeah. got to drive it in there. God. Put your back into it. <laughs> the whole thing. Wow. Uh, she wanted to watch that man die. She wanted to see no the life bullshit. leave from his eyes. <laughs> no bullshit. Shout out um, to, to this brown skin sisters. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're rough. They're very rough. They my type. <laughs> to Harlem Hospital, where he underwent two and a quarter hours of surgery to repair the wound. Curry wanted to kill Dr. King, she said, because she believed that he was a communist and had been spying on her and on the black community that he claimed to be serving. Curry oh, also suggested oh, that's valid. He was. <laughs> she, that's valid. <laughs> that's yeah, valid. He, she was a day he, sister. <laughs> yeah, he was a communist though. Yeah, that's actually kind of valid. That's yeah. why he got assassinated. That's what people don't talk about. That's why he got assassinated. Oh wow. Yeah. Man, yeah not because yeah, that mo- he was disrespectful with it. He was over there chilling with communist leaders at the time and going to their country and yeah, he was straight disrespectful. I don't know. Mm. I I when I look at Dr. King like and 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 Malcolm X, I don't really think Dr. King was as like knowledgeable as X was about this stuff. As far as like knowing politics and understanding, I think he was more just an orator and people kind of told him what to say. Yeah, he's a good speaker. Dr. King. His impact was larger than Malcolm X. Malcolm X. No, no, it was was yeah, but it was because like, it wasn't organic though, you know. Yeah, I don't think it was organic, and I don't think he really understood like economics, and and I don't think X really understood economics that well either. I just think X really believed the shit he was saying. You know, I don't I don't know how much King believed the shit he was saying, or he was just saying it because he he was an icon. He was a hope dealer. Yeah. Well, I mean, you blacks won the integration, man. He led a movement that led to that, that helped lead to that. So. I mean, he was. I mean, I mean, not, I don't. I don't necessarily think his his message was bad. I'm just saying, I don't know how much he understood. I don't think he was a real deep thinker. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I think X was more mm. of a thinker than he was. Mm. I don't yeah. know about that, but but yeah, I, mean, I don't listen, know how you decide that. Yeah, I don't know because um, X was um, you know, he was he was he was nation of Islam. That's kind of like a fringe group at that time, you know what I mean? Um, not as big as it is now. Um, Martin Luther King was, you know, selling out the Washington Monument, man. <laughs> sold out. Right. He sold out to Washington. <laughs> and Malcolm X, he, he did have more time to think because he spent more time in jail. So, yeah, exactly. Maybe there's something to that. Yeah, there wasn't TVs yeah. all over the place like there is today, and phones, and TikTok, and shit. <laughs> TikTok. Yeah. yeah. Suggested that dangerous connections were being forced between the civil rights movement and the Communist Party. The letter opener she used was so precariously close to King's aorta that had he sneezed, he would have punctured the aorta and died. Following the stabbing. Curry was placed in Bellevue Hospital for observation and was found not competent to stand trial. She was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Two psychiatrists reported that Curry had a low intelligence and was in a severe state of insanity. She was then committed to the Medawan State Hospital for the criminally insane. Charged with attempted murder, Curry was never put on trial. Instead, she was sent straight to the Mill Institution. After 14 years at Medawan, Curry was transferred to the Manhattan Psychiatric Center on Wards Island in Upper Manhattan, and then to a residential care program in Rosedale, Queens. After a fall resulting in a leg injury, 
Curry was placed in the Jamaica Queens, New York nursing home where she resided until her death. Curry died of natural causes at the age of 98. Curry died in relative. She lived in 98. That proves that what she did was right. So, no. uh, <laughs> she lived in 98. Wow. And she got off, kind of. Yeah, she never did. She never went to trial. Yeah, she didn't go to trial. But she did do time in a, in a crazy house. So. Yeah. I don't know if they were worse. much all her time. I don't know if they were worse back then. I mean, was that when, when asylums were still around? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure it was bad, and I'm sure that you know, yeah, it, it was rough, and they had um, techniques like techniques back then weren't like you know, <laughs> you have that. but at least they had mental institutions. Yeah, like, they people be on the they street. Need, yeah, they need to bring it back. She would be on the street now. She would have been if they, they would have found her incompetent to stand trial. They would have just released her. Right. She'd been yeah. on the fucking street. I'll tell you, I have never heard of this before today. I don't know if that makes me stupid or what. No one (laughs) talks about it. Never heard of this shit. Like, why? Why would you though? Why? No, yeah, you you wouldn't because she's black and she talked about communism. So, yeah, there's a narrative they they crafted around Martin Luther King. I mean, everything I learned in school, you would have sworn that you know, dude was like a saint that you know, yeah, was leading leading the sons to the promised land. You know, I can't imagine how fucking you terrifying tried. a million man march must have been. <laughs> See a million well, songs coming your way. Shit. Nah, that shit was awesome, actually. Was it? Yeah. I just I just remember seeing the BLM shit and thinking that, you know, how much of shit we've been lied to about in history. And, you know, wonder how, you know, how if they could spin what happened in 2020 as like something the same way. I mean, I wasn't alive, so I don't know, but I just know the manipulation the media has put us through. Like it wouldn't, nothing would surprise me at this point. Yeah. Real shit. You know? Yeah. I think, I think that's like the saddest part because after everything the media does, like I'm even doubting like in the sixties when they were like, Oh, they, they, they hit him with fire hoses and dogs. And I'm thinking, well, were they doing something? Cause yeah, I know right. you guys fucking like I know you guys fucking lie about shit. So you know, like yeah. and, and and it's like now you're doubting shit. Like you, like I don't want anybody to be harmed because of their their race. I don't think anyone should be treated differently. But now you're like starting to look at shit in the past, like and you, you learn about Emmett Till and about Tulsa. And the truth about that shit, and you're like, well, what the fuck really happened? Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of stories and shit. You know, Yo, I mean, I I just saw the um. The Trey, Trey, Trayvon Martin, the little the documentary Joe. I just saw that shit the other day. Oh my god! You talking about the one about um the guy who um the hoax, Zimmerman, the Trayvon hoax or something like that? Yeah, yeah, the Trayvon hoax. Yeah, Damn, I, saw that was, I just saw you, that. That's go see that. Go see that. Joint. Hell yeah! The, yeah, that dude. shit was wild. I mean, the worst part about that document documentary though was he's like trying to make jokes the whole time, and it was like, dude. You, you're not funny, but like, yeah, I mean, like he he had pretty solid evidence that these guys fucking made up a witness. No, thorough, not it's yeah. thorough, the most thorough was, shit. Yeah, I, I thought he was kind of funny. I mean, and you know, yeah, I mean, no, no, he was, he was, he yeah, was, he yeah, but like, scared. but like when when you talk about serious shit, I, I don't like the joking because I think it kind of takes away from how serious that well, shit I mean, was. His, I mean, no, like, his, no, it was, it was ridiculous. That 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 Trayvon Martin, a gang member, a guy who fights <laughs> every day, a very yeah. popular, tall, six foot one, tall, handsome kid with a bunch of girls sweating him, who's a very popular guy, with that Rachel, with Rachel girl, with yeah, girl. fucking oompa loompa looking. Mm. Yeah, oh, like that, when you that, see that shit was funny. I was like, damn. I know. Yeah, Trayvon talking. was popular. Trayvon was not like a, yeah. a, a, a nobody. He was very popular in his school. Yeah, and when you when you see the other woman, you're like, okay, now this makes sense. You know what right. I mean? Right. You're like, okay, here's the hot chick, you know, right. and then here's the gorilla. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? That like right. like and it was just like, what the 
the the thing that that was disgusting about that though was the dude did a DNA sample on the aunt or some shit. He was like, he went into a trash and got her underwear or some shit. Ugh. I was like, what yeah, the no fuck, man? No spoilers, no spoilers. <laughs> Dude, all right, he all did right. very yeah. thorough. He did very thorough investigation. Yeah. I respect that whole shit. Yeah, yo, did you ever see the other thing that he? Did you ever see the other thing he did with Obama's real father? Nah, I no, would watch it though. Yeah. I would, yeah, because no, I was like start it's for his other shit. It's it's solid, dude. Like that 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 dude that they say Obama's father. Like if you think about it logically, like go look at the African guy. He doesn't look anything like Obama. Oh, like he looks nothing yeah, like when, him. Hold on. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you have kids with a white woman, uh, yeah. it can look like change nah, things yeah. dramatically. Yeah, yeah, dramatically. So yeah, I, I don't don't just use that. As a thing, and Obama has four C hair too, so it's it, it's not like Obama got like good hair and shit. Like he you know right, right, like, right. he, he got like he got like four C hair, my G. <laughs> the technical term four C. It's a sun man. It's a sun man. It's a sun man somewhere, man. Oh, you know what I'm saying? No, no, yeah. It, it's not that he his father wasn't a black man. It's that it just wasn't that guy. The guy they picked, yeah, the guy they picked. Okay, just, yeah. okay, I'll yeah. give you that, but okay, but yeah, yeah. there's a son. There's he a found son the dad. Him. He he found it. You got to see the dad. Just go watch it. You got to see it. It'll all make sense. Okay, okay. What's that um, one called? Uh, yeah. Dreams of My Real Father. I think it's the book he wrote. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's good enough. That's the book he wrote, but uh, I don't know if he did a full blown documentary or just a web page on it. But just put in Dreams of My Real Father, and you'll he see the dreams. you'll see the you'll see the images. Yeah. Son, Dad bounced. <laughs> hey, let me get to this. Let, let me get to this, man. Before before um we get too late, man. Let me get to this the, the main event, man. Y'all y'all throw me um making me um. I did not even cover the real shit. Let's see. <laughs> Thanks to neighbors in that area, there is no damage to the home. Thank you for joining. Hey, thanks to neighbors in that area, there is no damage to the home. Thank you for joining us at 11. I'm Sean Gables. And I'm Blair Miller. If those people had not jumped in to help, Atlanta's chief of police says this important part of American history could have been destroyed. Atlanta News First, Joshua Skinner is live at that home tonight. And Joshua, the police chief, was at that scene because this is such a big deal. Oh, absolutely, Blair. I think you could make the argument that this is the most historic landmark in the city of Atlanta, the MLK birth home built in 1895 in the classic St. Anne's architecture. MLK was born here on January 15th, 1929. But today, this back in the days, because my wife, she just told me this stat, like 75% of people were born in the house like before 1950. And now it's like 95% are born in hospitals. Oh, just in that man. short period of time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's like, it was very common to be born in your crib. It's crazy. Um, salute the mad piece, man. Um, he says, salute big Oc. My algorithm is telling me that you got a billion likes. Congratulations. Damn, bro. You're bigger than the GTA 6 trailer. All I need now is to see Isola Curry and Officer Taser's son slap boxing in the octagon. I got my money on o Officer Taser, my son, man, man. She um actually she got more mouth. Um, never mind. You no, know, I'll take I'll take Isola, man. Isola bought that business. She right. chose the knife over the oh gun. God. She bought that business. Let me change that. Yeah, Azola. Azola would have gave officer that work. Um, yeah. Um, salute to Azola. She lived to be a 98 years old, died in 2015. A she stabbed one. Martin Luther King in 1958. She lived another 57 years. She go harder than most of them. around <laughs> <laughs> Check out this witness video. You can see a woman using a large red gas can throwing gasoline all over the home. Witnesses at first appear to think this is all benign until they smell that gas. And that's when people spring into action. Two tourists from Utah 
two off-duty NYPD officers. They stopped her as she tried to light the home on fire. It's a dangerous move by those good Samaritans, but everyone realizes that this house is more than just a house. It's Martin Luther King's birthplace. Like, it's hugely important, you know what I mean? Um, and And obviously, you know, important to everybody, but important to people who live here. Their quick action uh, saved the jewel of our city, something very important. They don't know black people don't even know that shit is right there. No bullshit. The, the average black person, like you live on, do you, do you know Frederick Douglass home? Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like five minutes from me. I could walk there from here. The A lot of our sons don't know that though. Don't know that that's yeah, right there, man. It's right here, right in our neighborhood. And if they did, would Yo. they give a fuck? <laughs> they don't give, they wouldn't they give a fuck. Yeah, yeah but the fact down. that they don't know, like, it's one thing to know and not give a fuck. It's another <laughs> thing to be raised in a neighborhood and not know. Like, yeah. it's blocked so, away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you walk by it every day, know. never notice. Yeah. I mean, it's not, and it's in the cut, to be fair. Like, it's not. It's not signs like saying Frederick Douglass. Over yeah, there, but it's, it's not sign, and it's nowhere you would go. There's no, okay. there's no reason to go back there. Only if you live there or you know that his house is there. But other than that, there is absolutely there's nothing back there. It's that's actually kind of scary. It's like not on the, it's it's trenchy, not on the block. Yeah, it's trenches. Yeah, it's the trenches. Yeah, it's like oh, you, you 